Hello, my name is Carol Goforth. I am a law professor at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, and I'm happy to be speaking you, to you today about a very recent and important decision out of the Southern District of New York, SEC versus Telegram. And the focus of my talk is going to be on the global impact of that single decision. Now, if we back up a little bit, the story of Telegram itself is relatively interesting. It is a huge, extremely popular social messaging program that a lot of people in the crypto community are familiar with. It was founded in 2013 by two brothers from Russia um, because of privacy and other regulatory concerns. They moved their business away from Russia and originally it moved to Berlin. It has subsequently been hosted in other international locations, although it has never been a U.S. company. Um, relatively recently, it has had as many as 300 to 400 million monthly users, depending on what source you want to believe as to how many folks are actually using it. But either number is very impressive. Uh, one of the interesting things about Telegram is that it doesn't charge for its services. You can use the social, social messaging function of this company and not have to pay for that service. Um, the costs of operating it, the costs of developing it, expanding it, promoting it, are borne by the brothers, both of whom are extremely wealthy as a result of other activities that they had engaged in. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not interested in fundraising. And in fact, in about 2017, they were actively considering ways in which they might raise funds. Uh, 2017, as you probably recall, was a, a very exciting year in the world of crypto assets in general. Um, not only was Bitcoin heading for its highest per coin value ever to date, um, crypto in general was on the rise. You were seeing an increasing number of new assets, new applications for the assets. Blockchain 2.0 with the possibility of all kinds of utility funds uh, beyond just serving as a substitute for currency were coming into vogue. ICOs, which stands for Initial Coin Offerings, were taking off. ICO being a takeoff on the IPO, Initial Public Offering, that was the acronym used for conventional sales of shares to the public. And at the same time, in order to facilitate compliant offerings, that is offerings of uh, crypto assets that are in compliance with the regulatory regime. A group of professionals uh, in San Francisco area associated with Protocol Labs and Cooley LLP law firm uh, came out with the SAFT protocol and a SAFT white paper. SAFT, you're familiar with all the acronyms that this particular space uses. SAFT stands for a simple agreement for future tokens. And in essence, it is a process that allows for the sale of contractual rights to acquire crypto on a when issued basis. And the neat thing about the SAFT process is that because of the way the securities laws work, you could theoretically do a limited offering of the contractual rights comply with the securities laws for that more limited offering. And then once you had a fully functional utility token developed as a result of the initial round of fundraising, the subsequent sale and distribution of your crypto asset is intended, designed not to be a security, so you wouldn't have to comply with all of the regulatory requirements. So that was the SAFT process, and we were first seeing that in 2017. The other thing we were first seeing was just how active the SEC intended to be, the SEC standing for the Securities and Exchange Commission. And for the first time, the SEC issued a formal paper ruling um, guidance on whether or not crypto assets were going to be securities. And in the context of the DAO, uh, a program that was hosted on the uh, Ethereum blockchain, the SEC said if they 
fit within the definition of an investment contract, crypto assets can in fact be securities. And so we saw for the first time a real expansion in the desire and use and potential for crypto as a means of fundraising for businesses and a very large indication that the SEC was going to be concerned. Now that's the environment in which Telegram proposed to issue its own crypto assets, which they were going to call grams. Now this was seen as a way for a uh, free, popular messaging service widely used by members of the crypto community uh, to fund their operations. They could not only be used by crypto enthusiasts, they would themselves be a part of the crypto ecosystem. Grams would be developed and then they would be sold worldwide. They would function on a network that Telegram was going to develop. They were going to call that TON, uh, the Telegram Open Network. Uh, and the plan was that these grams would have potentially, when developed and, and down the road, a number of different as aspects to them. They would have a number of different uses. Of course, they could be used as a store of value or a unit of account, much like conventional currency. But the hope was that they would also be able to buy specific functions on the Telegram platform itself. You could buy assets through other of, of the members of the social media community. Um, you could have whatever whatever additional functions might be added later on. So the idea was that grams would be issued, the network would be in place, and then users could come up with functionality. And it was just when they were on the verge of finalizing the grams and issuing that the SEC filed suit. This happened in October. Uh, and they filed suit seeking a preliminary injunction asking to recover funds, all of the funds that Telegram had uh, raised to date, and impose fines. Now, probably in order to make sense of that discussion, um, I need to give you a little bit of background about the U.S. securities laws. In general, in the United States, it is illegal to offer or sell a security unless you have registered or uh, found an exemption from registration. Registration is an incredibly cumbersome, expensive, time-consuming, difficult process. Um, can cost upwards of a million dollars to register a security for the first time. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, and, and consequently, exemptions become very important. And there are a number of exemptions for non-public offerings. And so that's what most uh, smaller or startup companies wind up doing when they start selling securities for the first time. So what are securities? Well, that's stock. It's interests, uh, ownership interests in all kinds of businesses, whether or not they be limited liability companies or corporations or whatever. Um, it's debt instruments like bonds or debentures. And included in that definition is that phrase that I, that I rushed over just a few seconds ago, investment contracts. Now, what the heck is an investment contract? An investment contract occurs if you are investing, putting in money, not because you're going to use something, but because you are putting that in, you're holding it, you're hoping to have appreciation or income from it, you are investing in a common enterprise where there are other people also putting their money in or where the commonality is between you and the promoter so that your fortunes are gonna rise and fall together. Uh, and the reason why you would do that is that you're expecting profits. And not only are you expecting profits, but you are expecting those profits to arise based on the essential managerial or entrepreneurial efforts of others. Which others? Usually the promoter, developer, or individuals, groups associated with those persons. Um, that is, in essence, known as the Howey test or the Howey investment contract test. It is derived from a 1946 U.S. Supreme Court case and continues to be the law 
in the United States as to what constitutes a, a, an investment contract and therefore fits within the definition of a security. And also, as I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the SEC has taken the position that crypto assets can in fact be investment contracts. And there are now a handful of cases that have agreed with the um, SEC that yes, they can be. Now, because it is expensive and time consuming and difficult and burdensome to register those sales for folks who do plan on having a sale of securities, the usual process is to find an exemption. And in order to have a, a valid exemption, all of the sales that are part of that same deal, part of that same distribution, have to comply with whatever the terms of that exemption are. And so that's the landscape about what the US securities laws are. The other thing that I rushed through and probably I need to explain just a little bit about is the SAFT process itself. Now, as I mentioned, SAFT stands for a simple agreement for future tokens. Um, and technically speaking, it, it was a particular set of contracts, the simple agreement, but realistically, the SAFT process covers any distribution idea, any plan where the first stage of raising money is you are selling contractual rights to acquire a crypto asset, a token at some point in the future. So for example, Telegram didn't actually use the SAFT documentation. They developed their own contract, but they did in fact have a contractual right that they sold to a group of uh, potential users, investors, who uh, met the terms of an exemption. And then those folks got contractual rights to buy grams, to acquire grams when those grams were issued. And I am including those within the rubric of what is the SAFT process. So it's a two-stage plan where the first stage is the developer, the promoter, the entrepreneur sells the contract. And the value of that contract, right, is going to depend on whether or not the promoter does in fact develop the token, the network, and that everybody agrees that fits the, the, the current definition of, of what is a security. So the contractual right is a security. It has to be sold in accordance with a viable exemption if you're going to comply with U.S. securities laws. That funds the, the, the group, uh, the amount of, of income that is earned as a result of selling those contractual rights then are used to enable the developer, the entrepreneur, to finish the crypto asset, finish the network. And then when the token is complete, the network is complete, the token is launched, and the folks who have the contractual rights turn them in and take uh, the new token home instead and do whatever they want with it. Um, that is designed to be a commodity, an asset that can be used, and at least the hope was that would not be regulated by the SEC. Now, if we turn our attention back to Telegram, Telegram did this. Telegram offered contracts to a group of uh, early investors and said, if you give us money now, we will give you a contractual right to acquire grams when we issue them and call them SAFTs, but that's in essence what they were. And these folks were buying something that Telegram acknowledged to be securities. And they structured that under one of the several exemptions under the uh, US federal securities laws. They structured this under Regulation D, Rule 506, which says if you sell only to accredited investors that you have verified, you have seen sufficient documentation so that you have a legitimate, realistic belief that they are in fact accredited, that sale will be exempt and you can raise as much money as you want. That's really fortunate for Telegram because they managed to raise $1.7 billion doing that. So an incredibly successful sale of, of, of these contractual rights pursuant to an exemption that was limited to accredited investors.
what are accredited investors? Generally speaking, accredited investors are wealthy folks. They are individuals with assets excluding their home worth more than a million dollars or with annual income of more than 200,000 or with their spouse, 300,000 or they are a number of different kinds of companies with assets of more than $5 million. So they're wealthy groups. So this was not a public offering. This is a limited private offering to wealthy folks who can uh, afford good legal advice. They can protect themselves. So those were designed to be exempt. Then the, uh, the deal was that as soon as they were finished, the development of the Grams and the Ton network, they would issue the Grams some of the new purchasers could immediately sell them. Some of the original purchasers could sell them based on a, a vesting schedule or a delayed uh, schedule. But the plan was that they probably would resell most of those, those grams. Um, and that would be okay. The company Telegram could sell or issue new grams. That was all supposed to be okay because at that point, the grams were planned to be commodities, not securities, and hopefully the SEC would not have cared. Um, the SEC disagrees, and they did so vehemently. They filed uh, a lawsuit seeking a preliminary injunction to force Telegram to refund the $1.7 billion it had raised worldwide, requested a permanent injunction, asked the court to impose fines for what they saw as a, an illegal because they say it wasn't registered and the exemption wasn't valid, so an illegal distribution of securities. And the reason the SEC thought this was all illegal is because they said you couldn't separate the first part from the second part. The sale of contracts was just part of the process of distributing the grams, and their the entire deal was an illegal public distribution of securities. So in other words, it's a single scheme taken as a whole violates the securities laws. So stop. That's what the SEC's um, decision to seek a preliminary injunction really meant. Almost immediately, the judge grants a TRO, a temporary restraining order saying, stop, we'll, we'll figure out real fast if you're allowed to do this. Um, and really, it comes back to whether or not the SAFT was truly exempt under Regulation D, Rule 506. Rule 506 is supposed to allow the issuer to erase as much money as you want, so long as you limit it to accredited investors. And that's what Telegram did. It sold those contractual rights only to folks that it had verified met the requirements of the exemption. And it did exactly what it said it was going to do. It used the funds to finalize the development of the Grams, creating the TON network, preparing to la launch the Grams token on the schedule that it had. Um, and it, it, it did everything it said it was going to do. But it also knew that most of the original purchasers were planning to resell their grams when issued or as soon as they could. Um, and it also knew that the new purchasers would be members of the public. They would not be verified accredited investors. They would be folks like you and me who are interested in promoting um, crypto assets. And Judge Castell of the Southern District of New York is a trial judge said, okay, I'm going to grant the preliminary injunction. I am going to enjoin, stop Telegram from moving forward with its planned distribution of grams. And I am doing this as a preliminary matter. So it is on the basis of pleadings and hearings, but not after a full trial. This is a preliminary injunction because the judge is convinced that the Securities and Exchange Commission has a better chance of prevailing, of winning at trial and convincing the court that after a full trial, if that happened, um, that the uh, Grams 
would be part of an illegal distribution. So what Telegram's immediate response was is, well, we're going to appeal this. And they filed an appeal with the Second Circuit. And they also said, hmm, Judge, would you please clarify? You've granted, you've said that an injunction preventing us from reselling and issuing any of our grams. What if we changed our deal and we gave back the money to the US ISP addresses? So anybody who's in the US or says they're a US citizen will refund their money, but we will still go forward with our sales to non US citizens and residents, and we will protect, uh, we'll make sure that they contractually agree not to resell to U.S. citizens, and we will change our wallet so that it won't accept U.S.-based IP addresses. And judge said, nope, if you wanted that, you should have asked for it earlier. It was really uh, fairly hostile towards Telegram's request for reconsideration saying you knew all along how broad the, the preliminary injunction was going to be because I just did exactly what the SEC asked. So as a result of this preliminary injunction, Telegram was precluded from selling its grams, issuing its grams anywhere in the world to any resident under any conditions uh, regardless of where they're located, regardless of whether or not they have any connection with the U.S., under penalty of violating U.S. laws. Uh, and the rationale that Judge Castell used was, you can't guarantee, and in fact, you can probably pretty much guarantee that it will happen. You can't guarantee that there won't be resells to the U.S. Um, citizens sooner or later, that none of your solutions are going to prevent this from harming uh, U.S. markets and U.S. investors. So it's all part of a single scheme, and we are shutting it all down. And you might be asking, okay, well, that's just one judge in a, in a country where we've got hundreds and hundreds of federal judges. Um, why does that one opinion matter? And it matters because it's the only precedent we have on this issue. It is the only decision that we have treating both the first part of the SAFT offering and the second part as a single distribution. So one thing that it does is it collapses the entire transaction, discrediting the entire idea of a, of, of a SAFT, at least potentially, depending on how you read it. The Southern District of New York, where this opinion arose, is generally accepted as influential in financial matters. And that makes sense because they see a lot of this. They see the cases coming out of Wall Street. Um, so the judges are sophisticated. The opinion is well-reasoned. It's thoughtful. Um, so only precedent, well-reasoned, likely to be followed. And it at least creates the risk that no matter where you were doing business, if you have things, crypto assets that are going to eventually be resold into the U.S., that your U.S. resources are subject to seizure for violating U.S. law. And realistically, even if you could segregate and say, I'm not going to sell to the U.S., man, you're giving up a huge market, and that is disadvantageous for U.S. residents, and it's disadvantageous for the crypto entrepreneurs. In fact, there are a ton of problems with applying U.S. securities laws this globally. Um, when we have tried in the past to have extraterritorial application of our securities and finance laws, not surprisingly, that creates hostility because foreign countries have their own priorities and their own laws. Why should the U.S. get to dictate how business is conducted in their nation? And that engenders a, a reaction that, well, if you're just going to do your own thing, we're not cooperating. Um, and from our perspective, we as a nation have less interest in harmonizing our approach to have a consistent regulatory approach around the world. And if we just look at what's good for U.S. and U.S. citizens, 
Um, on a global sense, we are creating unfairness because we're protecting our folks. We're not doing so well to protect the folks in other nations who you know, may not have access to what the US laws are, may not have good translations, may not need or expect or know how to process the kind of information that, that our securities laws uh, require. In addition, um, if you're doing business in another country, which law applies? That country's laws, the US law, it's both. And if it's both, then you have the risk of overregulation and redundancies. Anybody who's had to do reports and fill out one form for this person and the same information, but in an entirely different form uh, for a different person knows how annoying and irritating and expensive and time consuming that can be. Um, and the reality is that our priorities are not necessarily the priorities for the rest of the world. And it may simply be inappropriate to impose our view of what is necessary on countries who have a much stronger need, for example, to encourage innovation and uh, economic development rather than uh, we've got plenty of development, we don't need new technology of this particular brand. So there may be different priorities, different needs, uh, and our laws don't accommodate that. Now, I, I can't predict if this is going to continue to be the US law. There's another huge uh, social messaging service, um, the Canadian one, Kick, uh, that is currently in litigation with the SEC, SEC versus Kick, and the SEC is trying to shut down their offering of kin tokens. Um, now, the kin is already out there, so the remedies that they might get may be different, but they're arguing again that the SAFT, the, the sale of contractual rights and the eventual issuance of the tokens should be collapsed into a single deal and a single scheme, and there should be global consequences. Um, so that might have a different result. It is also in the Southern District of New York, but it is in front of a different judge. Uh, at some point, I would expect that there will be an appeal to a circuit court um, and you might get a circuit court decision. Eventually, we would hope to have a ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court because you run the risk that different circuits could have different rules. But the SEC uh, brings these cases and kind of picks and chooses in the Second Circuit, which is where the Southern District of New York is, um, is generally in favor of the extraterritorial, extraterritorial um, application of U.S. securities laws. So I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, it's also possible that the SEC's approach to crypto could change. Uh, it's not unanimous. Uh, Commissioner Hester Pierce, um, the commissioner who's sometimes known as Crypto Mom, um, it was very opposed to the SEC's aggressive stance in these cases and has proposed various solutions to this. Um, as long as we are pro-innovation, pro-technology, not so much in favor of over-regulation, we could also see potentially a legislative response. Um, and it is possible that you might be able at some point to structure entirely offshore operations that do exclude the US, or even if they don't really exclude resales, they are beyond the reach of U.S. laws. They don't keep any of their assets here, any of their folks, any of their businesses, no U.S. bank accounts. So let the U.S. regulators do what they want. They're just not going to come within the reach of the U.S. regulators. Not ideal for, for U.S. Uh, uh, economy if, if everybody's moving offshore, but it's a potential response. Uh, I think in conclusion, the, the key takeaways from all of this are that crypto entrepreneurs should be extremely cautious about proceeding with the SAFT at this time. I, I, and I don't mean that just the SAFT documents. I mean, any of these plans where there is a two-stage offering where you buy contractual rights with the hopes that eventually you'll be able to get the token when they are issued. Um, even limiting sales to non-U.S. residents is not safe. That global reach is really problematic. 
uh, you have both the SEC and at least one federal judge willing to be pretty aggressive in integrating everything and treating it as a single distribution and applying U.S. law globally. Um, I, there are arguments about how to limit telegraph, but at this point, the risk of proceeding with a SAFT distribution uh, is front and center. It is right in front of you. That's the authority you've got. So my danger, danger, Will Robinson, be careful if this is the way that you choose to proceed. And that is it for my presentation. I would like now to take any questions that might come up.